Good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. So first of all, a big warm welcome to all of you. We are excited that you're here for our workshop, and we hope that you enjoy learning a little bit about online instruction and inclusivity today with us. So first off, we're going to start with some introductions. Um, Julie Sarah Boyd is the Assistant Dean of Online Education with the School of Education. Symphony Bruce is the resident librarian at the University Library here. Um, Joan Hua is um, walking around. Um, <laughs> she is the Instructional and Multimedia Technologist with the eLearning Support Services, also in the library. And then we have Hannah Park, who is the School of Education and Specs Librarian. Um, for the University Library, and then um, I'm Ashley Ricamo, and I work as an instructional designer in the learning support services of the library. So, um, as you may be able to tell from all of our titles, um, all of our jobs here at the university have something to do with making teaching and learning better, particularly in the area of online education. And so this was the reason that we wanted to come and have a workshop with you guys, because this topic of online learning and inclusivity really is a perfect intersection for all of us between our work, research, and personal interests. Okay, and so our goal for the workshop for today is to kind of serve as a starter kit for you guys, to get you started on the path towards making your online um, courses and programs a little bit more inclusive and a little bit more um, equitable for your learners and your students. So what we'd like you to do today during the next hour with us is to start thinking about the different tools that we're going to present you with today. We're going to present different um, theoretical and practical tools for you. Start thinking about the ones that would be easy to implement in your own courses that you would be most excited to try out. And then think about also which ones are going to be the best fit for your particular online program or online course. We'd also like to get you started thinking about the ways that um, inclusivity in online education and social justice can interact. And then also we're going to give you time um, and an opportunity to practice applying some of these tools to real life situations that then you can take with you later. So the structure for our workshop today is up on the screen. We're going to start off with a quick introduction to online learning and inclusivity and why they kind of go hand in hand. Then we're going to transfer and start talking about student engagement in both the program level and the course level. And then we're also going to um, share with you some different tools and strategies and then give you guys an opportunity to practice applying them. So Symphony is going to get us started with our first section and talk about online learning and inclusivity. Good morning. Hey. Hey. All right, so today, like you said, I am Symphony, resident librarian, um, and I will get us started thinking about what online learning and teaching looks like here in American and on a national level. Um, but throughout this hour, we're going to ask you guys to talk to each other, to work with each other a bit. So I want to make sure that you at least kind of know, you know, or you might have some familiarity with the person around you. So if you'll just please turn to the person to your left or to your right and introduce yourselves. <laughs> if you know these people, say good morning. Yeah. All right, wonderful. Okay, so before we kind of get into the nitty gritty of the sort of inclusivity and the accessibility parts, I want there to be some vocabulary that we all agree on as we talk about online learning. Um, so the first terms that we'll talk about are the kinds of online classes, because um, there's many ways to do online learning. So the web enhanced course is probably the kind of course that most of us teach if we do face to face in-person kinds of teaching. So that is, we ha we meet on in the classroom, we see each other in person, but there is some sort of an online component to the course, whether it is discussion posts or the way in which you collect assignments, that becomes the web-enhanced course. 
The blended or the hybrid style of online teaching is when we take the best components of online learning and classroom teaching and we bring them together. The online component then reduces the amount of face-to-face -face time we get in the class so that we can have the sort of accessibility and the organization that an online course provides, but we can have the sociability that the face-to-face -face class provides. Now, our fully online classes or online programs are the type where all of the teaching and all of the learning happens within the online environment. There is sometimes little or no sort of face-to-face -face interaction, and a lot of that teaching and learning and expression of ideas becomes really text-based. Those fully online programs can be presented in a number of ways, or a number of styles, I might say. So the first that we'll talk about is asynchronous online instruction. That's the kind that gets a lot of research and a lot of attention. How do we make online learning, um, the efficacy of online learning when there is sort of no sort of face-to-face -face interaction? These are your types of classes where everything happens in the online environment, but students can kind of work at their own pace within the parameters of the course schedule. This is a great style of learning for those who have to fit their learning in and around their real lives. When it comes to synchronous online courses, we mimic the interaction of the actual classroom by having students and instructors meet in a virtual space. So we'll use web conferencing types of platforms to bring people together at the same time so that we can mimic the kinds of discussions and quick feedback that we might get in the physical classroom um, while other things might happen in a very text-based format. Those online platforms that we use are called learning management systems, and you might be surprised to know, or maybe not surprised to know, that there are many that are used on Americans' campus. So you might interact with your students via Blackboard, Schoology, Moodle, and eventually I hear we'll be moving to Canvas. So, and probably many more other than just that. Also, you might see things like Skype, email, obviously, being used to facilitate instruction. So, those are some of the words that we'll use, um, but I would like to get a feel for who you guys are as teachers and as learners yourselves in relation to online learning. So let's just do a kind of a raise of hand action here, get ourselves moving a little bit, okay? And I'd like to know, by raise of hand, how many of you guys teach online courses, fully online? Wonderful. Quite a number of you. So we've got a lot of great experience in the room. How many of you guys teach a web-enhanced course? So you're face-to-face, -face, but you have an online component. Okay, and I would say that's probably the rest of you. The things that my colleagues will talk about today will bridge that space between what happens face-to-face -face and what happens in the strictly online. That even if you're still teaching face-to-face, -face, you can make your classes more equitable and more inclusive by using sort of those online pieces. And then, of course, we'll be talking about that blended and truly online teaching experience. But as students, um, I want you guys to think back to your own degree programs, that master's degree, that bachelor's degree, maybe even high school if you're as young as me. Um, and, and to, sorry guys. <laughs> and to think about um, how many of you guys have taken um, a web enhanced course? So your face to face online component. Okay, so good, most of you, as I expect in today's world. How many of you guys have taken an online course? All of your teaching done online? Okay, okay, good, 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 good. And then I'd love to know how many of you guys completed a program, your entire degree, was done mostly online? Much fewer. And I think that this is a really interesting thing to think about. A lot of us know from our own experiences as learners what teaching can look like in the face-to-face -face classroom. But far fewer of us have a really great understanding or an idea from experience what great online teaching might look like. And so I think that this conversation is really important. How do we bring the best parts of face-to-face -face teaching into our online experiences? <clears throat> but just a few interesting pieces of information here that you might find interesting. In the fall of 2015, according to the National Council of Education Statistics, in fall of 2015, there were almost 6 million students enrolled in at least one online course. Uh, the National Council for Education Statistics calls this a distance learning course, but oh, that's a whole lot of people. 
When it comes to students who took exclusively online programs, enrolled in exclusively online programs, that number is about half, but that's still a lot. That's three, almost three million students are choosing to do their entire degree programs online. And we see that here at American University. I'm sure you have heard that out of our four most popular master's degree programs, three of them are online. And so we're seeing that across our country as well. Some other interesting tidbits that you might be interested in knowing um, is that 12% of undergraduate students are choosing to do their entire programs online. This is quite surprising to me. I don't, is it surprising to you? I think of college as something that you go to. I, at least that's what I did. But that's you know not the case anymore. We have a population who are choosing to do all of their schooling online, and even high school. And then probably less surprising is that a quarter of all graduate students are doing their programs exclusively online. And I was one of these students in 2015, I was part of their study, I suppose, where I was a fully online master's student doing my master's of library science. And going to grad school looked really different for me than going to my undergrad classes. I met the identities of many online learners I was a working professional. I was a high school English teacher that for many years. So my working life was very busy. That's not a 40 hour a week job. You know, that's like a 50 hour a week job when you dream about your kids at night. You know, like it encompasses your entire being. And then I'd leave the classroom and I'd drive home super fast, really illegal. And I'd sign into my computer and I'd sign into Blackboard. And this is what it looked like for me to go to grad school. You can see I was a little Instagrammer in 2015. Um, but you can see here what it looked like for me to do a synchronous class. You can see the thumbnail, perhaps, of my teacher up there getting ready to lecture to us. My bowl of tomato soup because I ate while going to grad school. Um, and this is the experience for many people. But I would spend my days teaching in the classroom. My days were filled with trying to make this the most engaged, the best learning experiences for my students. And then I'd go home and I'd get online and I'd have this experience as a learner. And my experiences as a teacher and as a learner were very, very different and caused some discomfort for me. What I understood to be best practices and engagement were not happening in my online classroom. They just simply weren't. The things that I knew because of my own philosophy of teaching and how we engage students, I didn't think could ever happen in the online classroom. And that was the relationship piece. I did not feel the best connection with my classmates or with my instructors. And I'll say it took a really long time to get to a point where I did build connections. And so my own research and my own interest made me really concerned with how do we make online classrooms as transformable and as amazing as they can be more easily when we have that face-to-face -face component. So I know a lot of us have some experiences of being online teachers, and I'd like us to quickly sort of flip the script and try to think of things from the student perspective, how it might feel for them to be in your online spaces. So I'd like you to turn to those people that you introduced yourselves to, and I'd like you to have a quick conversation. From the student perspective, what might the exceptional online classroom or online learning experience look like? What might it be organized like? Uh, what might it promote? How might it feel for a student to be in an exceptional online classroom? Go ahead and talk. I would love to hear at least a couple of ideas. Um, what are some things that you think might make for exceptional online learning experiences for students? Anybody want to shout anything out? How about being organized like a real learning community? Absolutely. Um, learning communities, um, cohorts type learning, uh, we know helps to build community and gives students um, power over their learning, which is really important. Anything else? Yeah. Well, I would say, um, Substantive and um, I wouldn't say immediate, but within a re within whatever clearly was clearly um, expressed as when the when the feedback would be given, so that you know if you lay that out right up front, then they know that they'll get feedback. But even the good students want feedback, not just the students that are not doing well. Absolutely. We have to have that constant conversation. I would agree that probably for most students, when they feel really um, I don't know, discouraged by their online learning, it's that they don't feel like they have enough communications between them and their instructor, whether that is through feedback on their work, uh, participation in discussion boards, um, or even just, you know, 
checking in, how are you? All of those kinds of communications are really transformable. Okay, so like I said, in respects to time, I'm gonna move on to our very last piece of, um, of vocabulary. And that is the, and you might, this might be a little hard to see, but this is the definition of inclusive teaching. This comes from Washington University in St. Louis. And I think that they did a really great job of, of summarizing what inclusive teaching is. And I think this is a really great framework for us to think about the rest of our session today. And I'm gonna go ahead and read it out. So inclusive teaching posits cultural diversity or differences related to identity and experience as crucial to learning. The practice of inclusive teaching involves consciously working to foster learning across differences. For example, by acknowledging and challenging biases and stereotypes that can impede understanding and undermine a student's sense of belonging to the discipline or institution. The practice of inclusive teaching also involves keeping accessibility and transparency in mind when designing courses and assignments, as well as being aware of power differences within the classroom and of social factors can, that can affect learning. Your students, when they come to your online classes, bring a self with them, even though they are not coming into the physical space. And how we can engage that sense of self, that individuality, and the way that their backgrounds um, can enhance the learning and the teaching that happens in that online classroom are things that I want us to think about as we move along to my next colleague, Julie Sarah, who will talk a little bit about student engagement. Thank you, Symphony. By the way, um, if you ever want to feel really smart, hang around with librarians because <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> So I'm going to briefly talk about accessible classrooms and student engagement and really how they're contradictory terms, um, especially um, at, um, in SOE where we are doing a lot of our online programming. Um, before we do that, though, I do want, I like, I'm a big believer in controlled chaos, so I would love to get um, your thoughts on what, from your own experience, um, if you're teaching an online class, or maybe just your own perceptions of what an online student looks like. I use looks, you know, very vaguely. So just shout out. No hand raise, just shout out. Professional. Working professional. Military. Military. Parent. Career changer. Parent. Career changer. Tired. Tired, <laughs> yes. Especially when you have classes at 7.30. Anything else? Well, you're all correct. Congratulations. <laughs> and that's over. Um, in the School of Education, we've been running online programs. We've been running online courses for a while, but online programs for about a year and a half. And um, at this point, our online programs capture about a um, little less than half of our undergraduates. So um, this is just a snapshot um, as of now what our um, school of Education on-ground students look like and what our School of Education online with respect to race and ethnicity. Um, where the blue, sorry you can't read it, the, the big blue is white students, the orange is um, black or African American, uh, Hispanic and Latino, and this one is the Asian population that we serve. And what you can see is there is a pretty decent difference in a short amount of time. Um, this doesn't just have impact in the classroom when you're teaching students. It also has impact um, within our field in education. When we are um, training teacher, teacher educators, and, and pol education policy makers, we want representation, and it matters to us. And so we have to really think about our students. Now, the beauty is, in an online program, it is inherently accessible, right? You put a class online, and those populations that you talked about, the veterans, the parents, the tired working people, the people that don't want to deal with um, traffic, can access our classes. Um, because we, we create online programs, we have to be super thoughtful. I heard that word from someone, being thoughtful and prepared. And we have robust student orientation. We have robust system support. Um, we have proactive advising in most of our online programs, not just in education, but across the campus. Um, we utilize technology. We text our students. We do phone calls. We use emails. Um, and 
our support services on campus are starting to really buy into this accessibility and the need for it because our online population is growing where many of our events are being live streamed, um, whether in the university or the school of education, and um, we're really just saying, okay, if we're gonna do something on campus, it has to be online as well. So the beauty of online education is that you do have this accessibility component. The problem is you don't have the engagement, right? Now, we had an interesting discussion when we were planning this that, you know, we said, okay, online classes are inherently accessible, but they're not inherently social. I would argue that most ground classes are not inherently social anymore. Because those of you that teach on ground, you walk into your classroom and what are the students doing? Looking at their phone. And so even when I started teaching at AU seven years ago, when I walk into a class, I'm like, hey, how are you doing? Let's talk. Now I really have to work at it. And that's the key here, that you really do have to work at engaging with your students. And not just in the content, which we'll talk about um, in a little bit, but also with just engaging, just knowing your students. One of the, actually, the, I do think it's a fun part of my job is really the recruiting faculty. And you can imagine when you start a process of an online program that you have a lot of faculty that just don't believe in it. I wanted Symphony to ask earlier, how many of you um, did a, a program where you didn't even have an LMS? That was me. So, you know, you have a lot of faculty that didn't, that, that really don't understand online education. And one of my faculty said to me, I cannot get to know my students as well in an online classroom. And I take a deep breath and I said, well, how do you do it? How do you do it on, you know, how do you do it on the ground? How do you do it on campus? Because that is transferable online. But again, the work that we do in an on-campus class, it's work. It just feels natural to us, but it's work. We have to do that online. So I'm going to ask for your thoughts and opinions, but some of the things that I've seen at the School of Education, as well as in other online programs on campus, is you know doing a beginning of a semester survey. Ask, ask about your students. Um, ask about barriers. You know, what's the best time to have appointments? Even on, again, these are all strategies we can use on campus. Um, starting virtual communities. A lot of the students start their virtual communities already, but we start virtual communities for our students in the School of Education. We start virtual communities for our faculty as well. Signing in early to class. This was a great tip someone gave me when I first ta taught. And they say, you go into your classroom 10 minutes early, why don't you go into your virtual classroom 10 minutes early? And there's a lot of great chatter that you can do with your students and get to know them. Staying after class. Many of us do that, but really staying after class and being purposeful about it. Using multimedia for discussions, you know, audio and video. Again, we're not talking about content right now. We're just talking about just engagement in general. Um, and setting up individual student appointments throughout the semester to meet every student. And I put an asterisk there. This is something one of our faculty members in School of Education does for both his on-campus and his online classes. And really, it's not a lot of time. For those of us who are K-12 teachers, you know, we're always told in the first two weeks you call every parent. Why don't we do this in higher ed, right? Um, not the parents, but the students. <laughs> okay. It'd be weird. Um, but, you know, that, that, and this is something that could be really um, utilized in a, an asynchronous. We do have a lot of asynchronous online programs. Just make a 10-minute virtual appointment and get to know the students. Um, a few people in the room, as well as the panel, knows that yesterday was my Christmas, and I got a Peloton, and I was so excited. I've been looking for this Peloton for two weeks. I left our planning meeting yesterday. I was like, I gotta go. My Peloton's coming. <laughs> and I remember a colleague sent me an article about a year ago about Peloton and online learning. And I took my first Peloton class this morning at 5.30. Very exciting. It was great. Um, but it was interesting that Peloton is just a lecture-based classroom, right? This person's yelling at me and telling me how awesome I am. And based on my username, they know me. They know how many rides I've done. They know my metrics. And they, when you get a shout-out, they're like, nutsy boy, this is her first ride. You feel like the most amazing person in the room. It doesn't matter that I'm schlubby and I'm sweating and I'm trying hard and I'm probably failing. 
And I thought while I was doing this, I was like, you know what? If our online faculty just did a little bit, take a metric, one thing about a student, and give a shout out, that engagement increases, right? So Marzana talks about the student-teacher relationship. It's not that difficult. It does take work, but it's not that difficult. So I want you to think about that as we look at our scenarios as well as the classroom. Um, so throughout this presentation, we've been asking you to basically think about three essential questions. Um, how do you view yourself as a teacher? How do you view your students? And how do you view t online teaching? Because I think these three, answering and th really thinking about these three questions will deeply influence how you teach and how you st your students will learn. Um, so just think about this throughout the rest of this presentation. The notion of critical pedagogy came from Paulo Freire, a Brazilian educator. And in critical pedagogy, um, teaching practices emphasize critical dialogue and engagement. Uh, knowledge is socially constructed and culturally mediated. It uses constructivist practices of knowledge creation that promotes shared power, shared power between instructors and learners, ultimately to enact social change. Um, put in another way, it centers practice on community and collaboration. It remains open to diverse international voices, uh, requiring invention to reimagine ways of communicating and engaging. Um, it must include a multiplicity of voices, and it should have use and application outside of traditional institutions of education. So at its core, critical pedagogy involves student-centered learning, valuing student voice, practicing and promoting dialogue, shared decision making, valuing students' previous experiences and ways of knowing. And if you go back to those three essential questions that we've been basically been asking you to think about, how do you view your students? In traditional models of education, students are considered to be these empty vessels where you fill them with knowledge, the knowledge that you give them. But in a critical pedagogy framework, students are not empty vessels. They bring their own life experiences, their own knowledge, their own cultural, class, racial, historical, and gender contexts, uh, including a long history of previous schooling and educational hegemony. Um, so if you think back to how you view your students, in a critical, literacy, in a critical pedagogy framework, you'd want to take students where they are and think about what they need in order to have successful participation in society um, using a dialogic problem-posing um, methodology. And also, um, if you think about that third question that we've been asking you to think about in terms of how do you view online teaching, be critical also of the digital spaces that you're using to teach, understanding that digital spaces are not automatically equitable spaces. So really thinking critically about that as well. Um, I want to go back to Freire here. Um, and something that he really kind of that underlined that, that's foundational to his work as an educator, as he saw it, a key component of the teaching learning process was the demonstration of love and the cultivation of community among the instructor and students. That was a foundation of education for him. Cultivating, uh, demonstrating love and cultivating community. So I want you to really think about that too as you go into your online teaching. And we've been giving you lots of practical kind of applications for how to engage your students, how to build dialogue, um, but again, really go back to Furry, who believe that dialogue be begins not with what a teacher professes to know, but with students' experience and knowledge. So building your dialogue and your class on what students know and what they bring into the classroom. Um, if you're teaching an asynchronous course, I think it's really important uh, to have students see your face, hear your voice, see each other's faces and voices. And there are other tools out there. You can use Flipgrid which is a video discussion platform where students can videotape themselves, post it, and view it later. Um, so there are other tools and methods of bringing voice and your face, your presence, into a classroom online, even if it is asynchronous. Um, and other people were talking about constant reaching out to students individually, giving frequent feedback. Um, another idea might be having posting short informal videos of yourself, maybe talking about the lesson for the week. Uh, varying up the ways that students can engage with each other and with you 
through video chatting, discussion boards, emails, voice recorded comments on assignments, um, giving students the opportunity to do the same. But ultimately, in, in all of this, paying very close attention to whose voices are being heard, whose voices are being valued, um, and considering the content and reading of your course carefully. Do they include a multiplicity of voices and perspectives? Does the course material, is it inclusive? Um, could you maybe incorporate your, your students' feedback into this? And being really present in that space as well. Um, and it, I, I went to a School of Education alignment workshop yesterday, and um, <coughs> during one of the, the lunch panels, they brought in teacher candidates, the current students, master's students. Two were on campus, one was online. And they were in their practicum, or they had just finished student teaching, um, and a comment that one of the online students made was really interesting. She said that she automatically turned to her classmates for advice during that student teaching practicum. Um, and it was really interesting because that online space provided an automatic framework for that. The on-campus students said that they did the same, but it, it was in kind of this formalized space where they could automatically turn to the classmates. So I thought that was really interesting um, from that workshop yesterday. Uh, in terms of co-creation of the, the, the syllabus or the, the class, uh, maybe involving your students in developing course goals, objectives, expectations, giving them authentic opportunities to lead, seeking out, acknowledging, and using student expertise, um, especially in these online spaces where your students might be non-traditional students who bring a wealth of prior experiences into the classroom, allowing them to problematize scenarios based on their own experiences, um, Differentiating instruction. Again, going back to that, that workshop yesterday in the School of Education, um, the online student was a career changer. She was, she was working full time, she was a student teaching, um, and she was saying, and she, she had a shout out actually to Julie Sarah and to some of the other instructors, um, really thanking them for giving her opportunities to, to, um, to differentiate her instruction, instruction because she was so overloaded with all of these other life experiences that she was having. Um, and also because instructors can't always rely on seeing students face to face to, to, to gauge whether they're absorbing the information or, or um, <clears throat> really seeing how they're taking in the, um, their education, it, it requires students to manage their education in a different way. Um, so professors, again, instructors have to be really deliberate in building in these elements um, of engagement, of um, having students take charge of their learning. And ultimately, um, I want you to think about if we're if students are living in a culture that digitizes and educates them behind a screen, it requires an education that empowers them in that space and teaches them the language, um, the ways of, of learning how to connect um, with others within that space. So I want you to really think about how you can do that. Um, ultimately, the goal of critical pedagogy is to give students the agency to know, understand, and act upon, create or resist the reality. So I leave that with you. All right, so um, very soon we'll be moving into an activity portion, but we want to prep you with some more tools so you can think more about how to be inclusive in online learning. And so we talked about how the student population who might choose online learning could be different, could look more diverse, and um, we want to think about some of the barriers that online learning could have, and, and not just online learning, but in general in classrooms. And we talked about trying to um, overcome the, the barriers that an LMS might provide um, and how to create a community in the online environment. But um, we want to think about the textbook cost a little bit. And um, that could be a barrier for students too. And I know some of you were attending the earlier session on OER, so this is not a presentation on um, OER. I know a lot of you already know about it, um, but just to think about the social uh, justice component of having affordable course materials and open education resources. Um, so there are some options in addition to open educational resources. There are li library licensed materials. Some courses use a lot of um, just open online 
uh, articles, readings to supplement their their courses. And for online students especially, it's not necessarily just uh, the dollar signs of cost, but you have to think about when you have online students, um, there's distance students, so uh, they might not be close to campus, or their work hours might not allow them to go to the library and, you know, work with library desk schedules and check out books, even if library ha uh, the library has those resources. So um, when you're uh, thinking about trying to tailor your course to online students to the different needs, or you're converting your um, in-person course to online. That's an opportunity to to evaluate the readings and other materials that you're assigning, and how um, uh, you think about affordability and how uh, students actually access those information. Um, and one more thing I want to say is that uh, OER allows for adaptation. So sometimes the problem with um, just assigning a commercial textbook is that you're not using all the content or the content doesn't speak to the students or you know the the speakers the authors don't reflect or don't uh, connect with the students um, who may come from different backgrounds or who may have different circumstances or not be familiar with academia that sort of thing so when you can use OER or other methods to tailor your course materials you're also um, you're also meeting the different needs of your diverse student population. And, um, and the right side of the slide kind of uh, defines OER a bit for you. So um, I'll review that it's um, educational resource, uh, research materials that are in the public domain. And it's not, it's not just free and online. It's um, re materials that are released with intellectual property license that uh, allows for free use adaptation and distribution um, and at AU you have resources that that would help you um, look for these materials so for example you can go to CTRL the Center for Teaching Research and Learning and um, Kim for example and other specialists can help you find ways to supplement or uh, replace your course materials with OER materials and if you just want to explore a little bit, there are repositories like the Open Textbook Library and other other um, repositories. These are live links, and you have the link to the slide deck in your email inbox. We email that to you. So you can explore that um, on your own time. And now I will move on, we'll move on to Ashley. We'll, she'll talk a bit about um, UDL. here. Um, it's a long way to walk up there. Um, so as Jen said, so the last strategy we want to talk to you to, about today before kind of setting you loose to do some problem solving with some scenarios um, is universal design for learning, which you may have seen abbreviated before as UDL. But what UDL is, is a set of course design guidelines that are all about reducing barriers to learning and increasing options for, lear for learning for all learners. So a lot of folks associate UDL with um, students who need accommodations, but the way that UDL is actually set up is to um, um, increase the ability to learn for all of your students. So your tired student, your military student, your student with a full-time job, all of these sorts of guidelines are going to help um, create a good learning environment for those students too. Um, so if there's one thing that I want you to take away from UDL about our talk today, because um, I'm just going to very briefly get into this, it's the word options. Okay, so UDL is all about creating the options for um, how students are learning, what students are learning, and why students are learning. And those are basically the three categories represented on your screen today. So options for representation, which is your how of learning, expression is the what, and engagement is the why. So the first category on your screen here on the left, multiple means of representation, the guidelines in this category focus on offering learners a lot of different ways that they can acquire and absorb the information and the content in your course. 
So um, a really simple way to do this is to make sure that you offer your students content in different modalities. So instead of focusing on solely readings, you could maybe throw in a video, a documentary, a podcast, that sort of thing. Um, anytime you put up a lecture video, it's beneficial to your students to include lecture notes. And all of these different options, what they do for your students is they create a situation where students can um, learn according to their preferences and according to their schedule and their ability. Um, multiple means of expression, the second category, the guidelines in this category focus on providing learners with different ways to show you what they've learned. Um, by one way you could do this in your online classroom is to offer students different ways to show you what they've learned. Um, many times in upper level courses or master's level courses, the focus isn't necessarily that they know the ins and outs of how to write a paper, but it is that you want them to show you how they've synthesized the knowledge that they have and how they're connecting it to other information and other skills. And so you can use multiple media for communication and composition and allow the students to play to their own strengths. And then the last one is multiple means of engagement. And this really gets at um, why your students are in your class in the first place. And um, you want to make sure that your class is as authentic as possible for your students, that it's relevant to their needs and their interests, and that it is going to be a valuable learning experience for them. And that uh, this last per, um, category in particular really ties into what uh, Julie Sarah and Symphony and Hannah were talking about, about getting to know your students and their needs and creating um, a good community and also involving them a little bit in the why of the learning. Um, and so this was a very brief overview, as I said before, but you have two handouts with you. Um, the one is a kind of a graphic organizer of UDL strategies that gives a little bit more specific examples. And the second is a checklist that you can use as you design your um, online or face-to-face -face or hybrid courses to make your course site a little bit more student-friendly and accessible with these UDL guidelines. So I'm going to turn it over to Joan, um, who's going to introduce the activity for you today. All right, so now we're moving on into the activity portion, and there's uh, the third page that you have um, is the a worksheet. It has uh, three different scenarios. So now um, I want you to get into groups of three to four. Uh, probably try to cluster together with people that are sitting next to you. I know it's pretty awkward in an auditorium room, but that's the that's what they assigned us. So. Uh, Try to, try to find your group, and then uh, looking at the three scenarios, it's the page that says, uh, I think it says hands-on activity. Um, and read through the scenarios, pick one. So you just need to do one. And on the back side, there are some instructions, but it's a, it's a worksheet. So we want you to use the scenario and think about uh, the concepts and tools that we, we just presented and how you can use some of those to apply to the scenario. And so we'll uh, give you about 10 minutes. Um, so we'll come back at like 5 to, five to noon. And so, yeah, go ahead and we'll walk around and you can ask us questions. Okay, so... How many of you chose scenario one? And scenario two? No scenario two? Oh, okay, good. Um, all right, so let's start with uh, scenario one. What are some of the ideas that you have? One of the uh, suggestions uh, I made in my group uh, because I do this in regular teaching as well. Do I need to use that? Maybe. <laughs> okay. One of the um, uh, suggestions I made, because I use it also in my regular you know, classroom uh, lecturing, is whenever I have a class discussion, 
I like to assign a paper for that class discussion. It's a, they call it a participation essay. It's a brief paper, it's a brief position paper that the students have to write. And the idea is because all of the students have to do this, and I will collect the papers at the end, they come to class prepared to discuss. And this makes it easier for international students who need to organize their thoughts and, and put them in, in, in a coherent fashion. They have a chance to do that well in advance. And also shy students, American students who may be shy and not like to participate, have an opportunity to put their ideas in print and then they have that paper with them that helps them. So it's easily that could also be done online. Great, thank you. We have one more. Oh, okay. Um, hi. Um, I, ha I sometimes get um, a lot of international students because I'm in a weekend graduate program, so it's an all-day event. So it's like every, you know, six weeks, all day Saturday, nine to five. And I'll have sometimes um, international students who will request the ability to record the, just like put their phone on for the entire eight, nine hours. And, um, and I've said yes to that. I'm, I'm, I'm slightly uncomfortable with it, maybe. But it's really for their personal use to be able to go back. And a lot of times, it's not really like just your English language. It's more the terms of trade. You know, I'm in the media department. I'm talking about different film terminologies, different things about budgets or whatever. And a lot of times, those things are not automatically translatable. Um, so that's something that I do allow and I find is um, really helpful for the next class because they now really understood what I did and it's almost like they're doing extra work, but it's um, very helpful. So that's what I do for my little group. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, from, uh, I think there was a different group that did scenario one. Do you want to share some thoughts? So I suggested breaking the class into smaller groups because maybe, you know, some students are shy to speak up in a bigger setting, but if it's a smaller group, they might be more comfortable sharing your ideas. And another option is also instead of them having to speak up in the class, they can write their thoughts down as a minute paper or maybe voice it out as a discussion board post. Yeah, those are some great ideas. Um, and you can see the, the table on the back side of the scenarios. Um, you can try to organize your ideas in, into these different categories. Or you can try to, in order to see if they're balanced, you can think about some of the more theoretical approaches that we talked about versus the more applied. Think about cost, uh, cost affordability, accessibility, time management sort of side of things, and also uh, critical pedagogy and learner engagement. Um, so some other examples might be uh, for the uh, scenario one, um, you can evaluate how you how you want to grade participation because it's specifically about how, how you uh, assess that, right? So uh, is 30% a good port uh, weight um, for the final grade? And then can you also create um, even if it's not online class or if it's a hybrid class, you have Blackboard usually or a different LMS. So can you say, okay, if you had thoughts that you didn't have a chance to share in class, you have the opportunity to post on this discussion board for week one's class, and you take that into account when you assign grades. So that, yeah, you want to um, include students who might be more soft-spoken, may take more time to organize their thoughts, as well as students who have different um, uh, native languages. And I think we were talking about the idea of being I'm sorry. No, you can't wait for that. Yeah, I do. Sorry. My teacher voice, usually my students are like, stop. Um, being really deliberate about what it means to participate. You know, I think that we, as faculty, we use the syllabus, we reuse it, even when we make it online, we reuse it again. And we don't take the time to stop and think about what does participation mean. And the idea of like quality over quantity, right? It's not like just checking things. Um, so I think you know this when you when you do work in the online space or even in your own course, like before you start the spring, if you have participation down, which the students should participate, um, really being thoughtful about what that means and to, to be inclusive. Another inclusive practice 
is is for instructors to um, Mike, please. Oh my! Oh, I'm really shocked now. Another very inclusive practice is for instructors to utilize the the use of uh, student examples in what's an ideal post, what post hits the mark, and measure that up against the rubric. That's something that I've done when I've trained teachers in online facilitation. Um, because that invariably is a question students want to know is, well, why didn't I get full grade, or what is a quality post? I mean, you can put quality. I mean, of course, quality is not a very good determiner, as we know, but that's the point I'm trying to say. So make that very transparent to students, and it's via the instructor. All right, so let's move on to scenario two. So this one is about uh, more affordability of uh, course materials. So um, the group that did scenario two, you want to share some of your ideas? Oh, hello. Yes, good morning. Yeah, one of the, we discussed actually, can you all hear me? Scenario one and two. Um, but I brought scenario two because in the program that I'm currently directing uh, is quite a challenge and we see that uh, we teach languages in my department and we rely heavily on materials that are available to teach languages. It's just plenty of them, uh, but one of the challenges is the price. Uh, it, they're quite pricey and every semester we have to deal with that challenge for our students when we realize that our curriculum relies heavily on these materials yet a lot of our students have trouble acquiring these materials uh, based on their uh, budget so um, there's a couple of things that we're moving towards um, for example given the choice of the student of just buying a code with the online versions of everything instead of the printed textbook and just say only if you believe you need a printed textbook you need to purchase this but if not just buy the code uh, and um, we're going to do everything online and I'm going to display everything on, on Blackboard in class so you should be okay so that actually helps a lot the other thing that we do is that Thankfully, we work with some representatives uh, from some of these textbooks, and they know that this is quite a challenge. So uh, mm -hmm. sometimes we, there's a student that had approaches with this issue. We try to contact them to see if they can get at some kind of discount or something like that. And open resources is very much something that we want to acquire even more with them. Great. Does anyone else want to add something? I know I'm just a facilitator, but um, I've actually also taught in hybrid courses for a while. Um, and so one of the things I taught in a business school, so we have a lot of cases we can do, and we can purchase them on behalf of the student this way, um, so that, you know, I buy, I'm going to teach a class of 30 kids, I get 30 copies of the case, and then I can distribute it, which is a, not necessarily as easy for textbooks, but it does help with some of the study. Great. And... Um, Let's move on to scenario three. So the last one is uh, more about this is happening, I think, to a lot of faculty. So uh, say you have a course that you've taught for years, but now you have to move it to fully online and just thinking about some of the ways to make it uh, more inclusive so it's not just you know throwing all the same content to an element, uh, online on, uh, into an LMS. So, um, which group wants to share? Thank you. Hi. Um, so we talked more about the student engagement mm -hmm. side. Um, I work in SIS online programs, and one thing that one of our faculty members does is she opens up her, her classroom uh, to allow for study groups to meet during non-class times, which I think is really cool because it gives the students their own space where they can take ownership of their learning. And then she also comes in the last 10 or 15 minutes to answer any questions that might have come up during that time as well. So I think that's a really cool um, way to engage students more. Anybody else? 
Um, yeah, so we talked a little bit too about um, the online courses that we do through the SOC Strategic Masters in Communication program. Um, and there are some things that are already built into the, um, into the platform, but I think they really help. Like for example, delivering content in multiple modalities. Um, so we, in addition to having readings, there'll be videos, there'll be um, web links, there'll be, um, there'll be charts, or you know, there'll be all those kinds of different things for different kinds of learners, which I think is important. There's also a lot of active learning, so there's a combination of sharing things that um, like campaign materials that have already been created and then having them use those in order to find their own related materials, um, which I think then you know, gives them an example and then allows them to practice the, the skill of finding something similar and applicable. Um, and then in addition, we use technology like Zoom and something called Ask Your Professor, which is something that's on the, on the Wiley platform um, that allows students to, and professors to interact via video or to have kind of a, a virtual lounge where you know you can either set up a topic in a time or you can um, let the students lead that um, and, and use that as a space for them to convene. Did you guys want to add anything? In addition to the Ask Your Professor section, which is typically for questions that students have that everyone in the class could use an answer to. So it's a way to, to handle that kind of communication in a very productive way. The second feature we have is something called the student lounge. And this is different. This is a student directed space where they can talk about topics that they would like. Um, I tend to use it related to the content. I mean, we're, you know, we're not having happy hour, but if you're having a discussion that's, that's related to the unit and you want to add ancillary material, it's a great place to gather around the topic of ethics or something of that nature. So those are two features, the student lounge and the Ask Your Professor, which we have found uh, very helpful in promoting engagement, um, promoting inclusivity, et cetera. Great. Okay. Um, no, I was just, I, the thing that I keep on hearing today is space and place. And I think that's really important in fully asynchronous courses. In our SRC program, we are largely asynchronous with our partner. And um, those two that were just spoken about are student-driven and one is professor-driven. But the Ask Your Professor is very, very equitable. It is open to students to come on in and respond to other students' questions that are content-related. And so that, that's, just, that, that's a very inclusive practice as well. And, and demo, dem, democratic, I would say. Yes. And there's one more comment in the back. If I'm a, te uh, a teacher, I would like to do a video conference with the students uh, during the uh, first or second week of the class. If I am a student, I would like to see my teacher, how she looked like or how he looked like. You know, it's kind of like visual image to tell you that how I can communicate with my teacher or how I can communicate with my students. Thank you. Yeah, and um, so we talked about a lot of different tools, but other things to emphasize when you're moving from in-person to online is um, you kind of need to plan ahead more uh, before the semester. And when you have students who are busy, who are non-traditional students, time management is a big part. So you want everything to be very clear. You want to plan out you know, how much time you give them for projects and things like that. Um, and then uh, you can also think about increasing the diversity of your authors and speakers that you're assigning for readings and other materials. So um, I think we'll just start wrapping up. Praxis is a word that comes up a lot in the field of education. I'm a former high school English teacher. Um, and it's, it's, it, it's that blend of theory and practice that develops experience and reflection. And so building community, adopting critical pedagogy, using open educational resources, adding elements of universal design for learning, all of these will make your online courses more equitable and inclusive. And I want you to leave the session today thinking about these theories and strategies we've discussed so far. Um, try to apply them in your own online teaching practices, constantly reflecting and refining them as you co-create your class community with your students. So thank you. Okay, and one last, last thing before um, lunch is our resources slide. Um, I just wanted to take a quick second and point out what these resources are for you guys. We have kind of grouped them into different 
um, categories here, some for critical ped pedagogy, some for open educational materials, and some for UDL. So please feel free. We've sent you all of the slides in your email. So feel free to further do some research and investigation on the topics that interest you most here. Oh, and oh, yeah, you can also come to the library and speak to any of us um, in person, um, or CTRL is a great place for resources, of course, as well. So thank you all. We are very excited again that you are here today.